Oh. I've got nothing left. The grey cells have all merged into a great sea of Guinness. <laughs> thank goodness, thank goodness I've got my best friend and grown up, um, who I hope can string some sentences together that make a modest amount of sense. Because we're talking about something, or we're due to talk about something, which is, if you actually analyse it, if you actually looked at it 30 years ago, when there was a, another tossed pot of Prime Minister, uh, a country going under the hammer bit by bit, unrest, starvation, plague, famine, <laughs> and various sorts of war. And somebody put in front of you this book and they said, you know, in 30 years' time, in 30 years' time, this is going to be the, the start of a series of books. <laughs> millions of words, millions and millions of copies sold, the subject of star, stage, screen, and in some cases, labour exchange. It's going to be here. <laughs> You'd have gone, well, it's a good book. <coughs> I enjoyed it. It's quite a nice book. Maybe laugh. Quite good. But you'd never actually believe, unless you were absolutely convinced of the man's genius, which, let's face it, in those first two or three books, um, he was really, as he would say, as Tolkien once wrote, an essay in the craft. I mean, he was getting his act together. Yes. He was becoming a wordsmith. And it's very strange when we hear 30 years later, and, and, and this is very apposite, this particular convention, because um, next year there will be a convention which is organised within an inch of its life in a massive hotel with thousands of people. And uh, last year, or early part of the year, there was a convention in, in America which was organised within an inch of its life, which was obviously the product of a highly successful brand. And here we are in, in, in a slightly deliciously tacky hotel. <laughs> Which is, I mean, you know, it went into receivership about three months ago. And here it is. I mean, there's bits falling off the top, there's bits falling off the bottom. Um, there's unseemly stains on the carpet, but the, uh, the, the sheets are clean, the lavatories work, and the food is very good. Yes. And, and, and the pool is free. What? The pool is free. <laughs> and it, 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 it works, it's good. And it's, and it's deliciously. It's deliciously Irish, <laughs> and it's deliciously Irish, which in fact is keeping very much with the ethos, with the whole feel of Discworld. And, and we know that Discworld is going to be taken into the great realms of, of, uh, of, of television and of movies, and we know that there are people in plush offices Right now, we're talking about the brand. <laughs> we have to discover the brand. We have to protect the brand. I wish to protect the brand. And we're not talking about a mark on a cow's ass. <laughs> we're talking about a whole canon of work, which we all love. And I, and, and I just think it's rather nice. <laughs> nice being the exact word. I think it's very apposite that we're gathered together here, right now, huddling together before the storm sweeps us, if not away, but changes the world we love uh, and, and the man we love so very much. So let's look at 30 years ago. This is 1983, and we had a small pottery um, and it was in a chapel in a Suffolk village called Stansfield. And it was on the first floor of this chapel conversion. We had a large kiln, gas kiln, um, the chimney going out through the front window. Do you remember? Um, and we made ceramic wizards. We made one-off little sculptures, mainly wizards. Bernard had a bit of a Tolkien thing going on. Um, and. It was serious, oh, wasn't it, your fantasy it was book? Yes. It was. Yes. Did you break it? Yes, dear. Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, put it on for me. I can't do that. 
Yes, yeah, so we were, we were in this uh, old chapel conversion um, and we used to listen to uh, Radio 4 most of the time. It was on in the background. And on one, one day, one, one, I don't know when it was, but on a woman's hour, they read The Colour of Magic. It was the week's story. And that was when I first came across this world. And I said to Bernard, this is jolly good. This is very funny. And because we were making, I suppose, humorous fantasy, because Bernard, we made wizards, Bernard made gnomes, but quite often they might be sitting on a lavatory. <laughs> it was that sort of fantasy, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, Earthy. Uh, yes. Earthy. <laughs> So there seemed to be a little bit of a crossover in sort of humorous wizards, not too straight, and this wonderfully funny and original book that, that was like nothing that we'd heard before. It was strange, really, because, I mean, I must have told the story of Isabel and the Lavatory and me in the first <laughs> reading. I mean, this is... Uh, Isabel got the books, uh, got a couple of them, and, of course, they had Josh Kirby covers. And I looked at the covers and I thought, oh, I can't be really doing this. It just didn't do anything for me. And being a very, very clever lady, and, and she was, you know, oh, we've all been there. You know, Isabel's sitting in bed reading a book, laughing. Now, I don't know whether she's laughing at my amateur advances. <laughs> in fact, I'm wearing a rubber hat. <laughs> or I've got my Mr. Happy T-shirt on. But, you know, she's laughing because she's reading this lovely book. And it's me again. So, she took all the books out of the lavatory, bar, guards, guards. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. choice. And I've said to Terry over the years, uh, he's responsible for two things in my life. Um, the one is earning an almost honest living, and the other is hemorrhoids. Because <laughs> I've stayed in there so long, reading guards, guards, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it was the only book, the only book there, I mean, type on it, you know, the rest of it. Um, and I then really got quite hooked, and it was then a question of meeting up with Terry via Colin's mind, um, and a guy that we were employing as a, as a sort of uh, um, uh, a temporary grown-up, but it was, it was Claire Craft that, that we had at that time. And it was, it was a very interesting, um, very interesting um, uh, 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 wedding in a way, uh, 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 companionship really, because I got on very well with Terry, First off, very, very, very good meeting, very nice chat. And um, in fact, he, he uh, had um, sent me a drawing. Uh, if I, if somebody passes that round, you can pass it round. It's the very first drawing we got this from Terry, Terry. Yes, this is um, on Rincewind. This is how and so we, we got this before. But 1990. Yeah, um, before anything was ever done. We moved to a bigger done. shed by then. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I'd. Um, I, I picked up on, on what he had done. He, he, he sent me that drawing and I did a little sculpture. We met up in a, in a bar um, in Covent Garden where an Oompa band was playing. The sculpture I made was in wax because that's, that's how that sort of production is done. It's a hard wax. And so, um, and I said to him, it's wax, so it melt. And he wanted to take it home and I said he couldn't because I had to make the originals from it. This was an yeah. original. And so he, he was, uh, and I couldn't hear what he was saying, because he's softly spoken anyway. A bloody umpire band going on in the background. I'm sitting with my deaf ear to him. So it really was, uh, how we ever managed to communicate was com completely bizarre. And then we met up at very other, various other places, and I actually sculpted Rincewind, because, and it, it was very obvious that I knew where Rincewind was coming from. And at that particular point, I didn't know much about Terry. He didn't know much about me. Yes. He didn't know that I'd been a copper and spent some of my police career running away because you had to, you know. If you'd stayed around, they'd have hit you or you'd have had to arrest them, neither of which was a particularly interesting prospect. Both, in, both involved either paperwork or, 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 or soggy, uh, soggy dressings, so I didn't bother. So, 
that I knew what it was like to run away. You know, I really genuinely, genuinely did. Uh, as an adult, you know, run down an alleyway with umpteen people chasing behind me because I'd tried a nicker bloke at a gypsy wedding. <laughs> and I hadn't realised he was at his wedding. You know, I just knew he was going to be in the pub then. And I knew you know, there was a warrant out for him. And I wanted to get the bastard, not realising he had 15 brothers. And more importantly, he had a bride the size of a T-54 tank <laughs> in white tulle. And, 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 and so, you know, I'm in uniform at a time called Halstead. I wanted it. And I, I knew, I knew he was in the market arms. Because uh, everybody said, Christ, the market arms is going to get broken up. Jenny, uh, Bobby Doyle's in there. So I thought, I'll have that fucker now. So I went in through the, uh, through the back door, behind the bar, came out, and there's Bobby Doyle in front of me with his back towards me at the bar. So I lean across the bar, grab him by the collar, pull him right the way back, uh, and I've got a beer glass, a, a beer mug, and I say, you move, I'm going to clown you, you're nicked. And with that, the pub erupted. I thought it was a very good idea to let go of Mr. Doyle at that point in time. <laughs> but I didn't let go of the beer glass. <laughs> and then I legged it. And I legged it uh, out the back of the pub, down a little alleyway. And, and there, was, there was like uh, guards and houses sort of on the right hand side. Left hand side was factory wall. And there was this, this line, and the, the, the garden fences, for the most part, were, were all um, brick or bits of concrete. And at the time, I didn't know that they had glass embedded on the top. I didn't realise that for about two or three hours afterwards. But I, I saw the one I could leap across, leap, get over, as there was pounding behind me. There was the pounding, I'll get you, you fucker. I'll get you, you fucker. You come here. And, and, and the <laughs> from some woman. And so I was over the fence. Um, and, and as I say, as I got, still got the scars. And so I got over the fence and then ran through this. Through the kitchen at the back, there was the garden, washing, flat, 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 washing, 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 flat, 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 beer glass hand, flat, flat, washing, washing, hat, <laughs> through the back door, and there's, there's a bloke having beans on toast inside. <laughs> I can see him, the you know, back door flashes a crash, this copper comes through, morning, morning, morning. <laughs> out, out, the door, out through the back, out through the front door. And then into the street. Whereupon I blew my whistle. Pew. Nothing happened. But there was there was no sound of any pursuit. And then I realised that I was dripping blood and, and there was blood everywhere. And I still had a beer glass in my hand, except all of the beer glass. <laughs> Some of it had got lost. Um, and then I'm reading about rinsewind, and, and it just and it just absolutely connected. And it really did. I, and I, I, I was reading about it and I was saying to Isabel, I mean, all this happened before I met my best mate. So, you know, she has nothing to blame for those early years of my life. I'm sure it would have all been very different. I'd have been a chief constable then. Um, but, uh, it, it was, we could, I could connect. And, and you connected with Terry because he got on very well with you. He's always got on very well with you. Of course, he was favourite blue I, I, Yes, but also I think Terry, the, the, the women that Terry writes about um, are actually very strong characters in the books. I think that's one of the, the really nice things about this world, if you like, is that at the end of the day, the women are mostly white. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, that was his mum, wasn't it? I guess it was that his, was his mom. Mom. We, we, we met his mum yeah. um, only when she was quite elderly, but. Uh, um, I'd met his dad earlier on, and he's a nice, lovely man. He was a lovely gentleman, really nice bloke. And Terry always said, um, uh, see, my mother's a different kettle of fish. But we, we met his mother um, at um, Steel Ice Band, at Terry's 50th or 60th? 60th. 60th. Mm -hmm. And Rihanna, his daughter, had arranged Steel Ice Band to come and play. Uh, in, in a lovely marquee in a, in a field just outside uh, where we live. And um, as his mother, who'd had a stroke, and so she wasn't speaking terribly well. Um, and we were sitting next to her. And um, she wanted to get out and, and, and into the, uh, out of the market. So uh, she took my arm and we went on. And she looked at me and she said, it's my son. I'm so very proud of him. And I said a while later to Terry when we were on our own, I said, you know, your old mum's really proud of you. 
And she said, he said, well, she's never said it to me. And I think that's all part of what drives him, what drives people like us. You know, there's always, somewhere in the background, there's someone, there's a Granny Weatherwax, and Granny Weatherwax, without a shadow of a doubt, aspects of Granny Weatherwax was his mother. Yes. Um, and, and, and that strong character who drove things on, who did never compromised. And of course, that's also part of Terry's character. You know, what's bred in the bone is born in the flesh. And that's very much part of his character, that he, he is as judgmental to himself as he is to anybody else. Um, and and, and uh, he suffers fools sometimes gladly because he suffers me. <laughs> um, but he judges himself and, and, his, and his benchmark for his own work, for his, the virtue of his work, for the caliber of his work, his benchmark is incredibly exacting. And if you ever do anything with him, as we do, it has to meet that, to meet that benchmark. There is no compromise, is there? No. no. Uh, Shall we fast forward to um, <coughs> 96, I think she came as an old lady um, selling apples, which she thought she'd get away with. <laughs> but that was a, was, a, was a remarkable occurrence, and it's one of those things that people who were there would remember. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was how, absolutely uh, phenomenal. Yes, it was phenomenal. Because she was an actress, and she yeah. had the stage presence. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, I was standing next to Terry, mm -hmm. and as he turned around, I mean, and Pam had made herself up, she really was. Granny Weatherwax, yeah. it was absolutely phenomenal. Mm. But it was the pointing finger. It was. <laughs> and, and, and it just was absolutely amazing. So um, I think um, already we were building legends in a way. There were strange legends being built. That was the first one. That was the that first. Was and that was the first Discworld gathering, the first. Yeah. Um, and then 96 um, was the first actual convention. Um, in Manchester, who was there at that one? Yes, a few more, organised by Paul Krzyzewski. 
Oh, oh Rooney, was, he was in those there days. There was a bomb in the Armdale Centre, yes, wasn't there, the week before in Manchester, so before, it was yeah. all a little bit interesting. And the car that caught fire outside. <laughs> yes. We thought, yeah. oh, thought it was another bomb. That's right, mm. yes. Yeah. I've hazy moment, but it was, it, was, it was certainly the first of the many, many conventions that have, that have gone on ever since. Yes, it's strange, because it, um, I, I went to a convention, a science fiction convention with Terry, and it's the first one I've ever been to. And, and Neil Gaiman, and I, I, I was absolutely knocked out by it. I, it was one in Cardiff or somewhere nearby, somewhere in Wales. And he said, "You've got to come to this." He said, "It's a gas." He said, "It's an absolute gas." Be an eye opener. And so we, uh, Terry and I, went there, met up with Neil, and, and I couldn't, but I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe it. I thought I'd seen some strange sights as a copper, <laughs> and certainly I thought I'd been in some interesting places when I was a, a, a soldier. But by Christ, I'd never seen anything like it. I mean, now I'm immune to it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that, and I've seen so many T-shirts, it's unbelievable. But it was at that time, I was, shocked is the wrong word, fascinated, absolutely fascinated. And, and Terry, of course, taking it absolutely in his stride. Neil, it was the, this was the pond they swam in. And, and, and it, was, it was so intriguing to, 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 and of course, everybody knew Terry and this, that, Neil. Um, and it was obvious then that if there was ever going to be Discworld conventions, Terry didn't want them to follow the sort of standard format that conventions have. Yeah. I mean, Jack, you must have been to loads with your, 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 your skill set. I mean, you must have been guest of thousands. Well, well not thousands. But, but lots. Yeah, possibly a hundred. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. and this is Discworld that much different? Absolutely different. Is it? There's a togetherness here. Yes. Which is not there in. because they're all talk, thinking about different things and different authors. Yes. Um, there's a, a kind of disparity running through the whole thing right. in a, an ordinary science fiction convention. Right. But right. here, we all know what we're about. Yeah. There, there is a phenomenal togetherness. Togetherness, there really is. It's almost tribal. <laughs> and though it's better than tribal, it's because better. We, don't have, we don't have a chief, apart from you. But, you know, <laughs> uh, we don't have, well, we have a, we have a, a god. couple of gurus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're strong on gurus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, me, a few others, uh, yes. Jack, uh, Terry, uh, what have you. But yeah, it, 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 it is. It, um, but you find, uh, it, I have found over the years that um, some of the most interesting and delicious human beings <coughs> I've ever had the pleasure to yes. break bread with, I've found at Disc World Conventions or Disc World Gatherings yeah. or, or coming into our shop. Mm -hmm. You go back to the real bit, Okay, well, fast forward to 2000, which is when um, we up sticks from Suffolk and moved to Somerset and opened the Disc World Emporium. Um, which, when it first started, was part picture framing, part art materials, and a small bit of disc world. Um, and Bernard had embarked on making the unreal estate. So <laughs> <laughs> <we'd done laughs> yeah. Yes, there's a few of you. We, yes, how many tons of art core? <laughs> <laughs> With the Unseen University, which was the first piece, and then we sort of we could do the uh, <coughs> about doing the watch house, and then somebody said, "Oh, what about the assassin?" And, the and so it went on until the post office, I think. Yeah. All the vampire castle was the last pieces, and we were finished training off with those when we moved to Somerset, and thought, "Well, let's do something different now. Let's retire, perhaps." <laughs> when did you start Hogwatch? Um, ah. Well, we we actually we moved um, to Somerset in November 2000, and we had um, we thought we'll have a grand opening of the shop. And Terry came, and I suppose about 50 people who were not too far away who knew actually came. So that was the precursor of Hogswatch, but we had, we certainly had our first Hogswatch in 2001, um, and we twinned Wincanton with Ant Walk in 2002. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, at the time, 
It, it was Wing County was the only sort of place you'd get away with it, really, because. Um, well, you were on the town council, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. The mayor was Yeah, it was. He um, did, actually, he, he did. He did see the sense. He knew it would be good for Wincanton if he let it. He had the, the nerves to know that. He also knew he'd get a few free beers out of yeah. it. <laughs> oh, more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was the. He uh, sold millions of books by then. Yes, he had by two thousand. Yes. He, yes, absolutely, and I think. I think Guards Guards was the first book um, that went to the top of the top. Yes. Um, and that was, and he'd given up the day job uh, a couple of books before. Yeah, Mort, that. Mort was yeah, the one. It was early days. Still. Yeah, but I, but I wonder how how much um, you were buying into something that lived out there, and how much you were creating something to live out there <laughs> by by marrying <laughs> Wincanton with. It was, it's an interesting, interesting one, isn't it? Yeah. It was. Um, Terry had, had got done for parking and was really pissed off. I mean, he hates paying tax. If you really want to wind him up, <laughs> you want to say, I, I think a 40% tax rate is not enough, you know, certainly not somebody who's got a few bucks in the bank. I think it ought to be 60% like it was under a good old Labour government in the 70s, Terry, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, He'd be on 94% bracket. <laughs> yeah. So um, he'd, he'd been done for parking. And he was getting really ratty about it. I don't have a bloody park in it. I said, well, what you want is some CD plates. What CD? I said, called Diplomatic. They never, ever, ever do, do a, a, a CD plate. So it's pointless. It's just paperwork that never goes anywhere. Oh, he said, oh, I'll get them then. Uh, I said, well, what we really need is an embassy. Mm -hmm. said, you know, we need a friendly embassy. <laughs> so he said, oh, he said, an embassy? I said, yeah, well, hang on. I said, why don't we do a more embassy? Consulate. Uh, but we couldn't do an embassy, right. but we could do a consulate. Yeah. There is a protocol for having a consulate. And providing you tick the right boxes of the protocol, as far as both the European Commission is concerned and the Home Office, you can have a legitimate consulate. Part of ticking the boxes was getting uh, Ang Morpork recognised officially, hence Town Twinning. Because Town Twinning is in fact again governed, governed by um, protocols which have been signed by the United Nations, uh, yeah. as far as I'm aware. So it's really top dollar stuff. So once, but once you understood this, and, and we spoke to somebody in the Home Office, and I said, uh, what do I need to do to get um, Ang Morpork twinned with um, Wincant and the town where I'm on the town council? And he said, Ang Morpork, where the fuck's that? And I said, well, um, it's, it's a mythical place. No, 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 no. No, it won't happen, it won't happen. It can't be done, it can't be done. I said, well, there must be precedent for it. No, there's not, never been done. Can't be done, can't be done, can't be done. I said, oh, okay. I said, well, we're going to have to go illegal then. He said, no. He said, well, it won't mean anything. It won't be official. It won't mean a bloody thing. Will it, George, or whatever? And you heard him turn around and say, ain't more pork. Don't get him to twin. Ain't more pork. And you heard this, oh, yeah! <laughs> In the home office, yes. <laughs> and he said, Oh, yeah, give me a phone, give me a phone. And he said, So, yeah, what do you want to do then? I said, Well, um, Ang Morpork ought to have a consulate or an embassy. I'm saying, He said, I can't do you won't get an embassy. He said, That's crazy. He said, But a consulate? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He said, Well, what you want to do, he said, is convince the town council to actually put a formal application in for twinning. Now, he said, If you read the acts carefully, then you haven't got even to be on this bloody planet, providing it's a named place that people, you can actually say people recognise. You, you'll get away with it. It will fall between the cracks. So I said, well, what about all the official paperwork? He said, the official paperwork gets lost. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you are talking home office here. <laughs> so we put together a proposal for the town council. And of course, it's a small, typical, typical small, umpty bumpkin down council. So you've got a council of about seven people, 
three of whom are related and are on the fiddle, because one son always gets to do the window boxes, one son always gets to do the town cleaning, yeah. and the other one is just a bit of a waste of, you know, so on and so on. Uh, uh, who was a solidly good, honest, upright crook <laughs> from, from Dagenham in Essex, who had moved down after making a lot of dodgy money and um, had, had, had promptly bought the big house and, and became the mayor of the town council. Done his term, mayor of the town council, and was a Freemason. I, at that time, was all, well, I still was a Freemason, but not in Wincanton. Although you are anyway in the world, but. I didn't go to the Wincanton Lodge because the grub was so shite. I used to go to my lodge in Suffolk because the grub was very good. <coughs> so, but I still did a handshake and I was still further up the greasy pole in Freemasonry than he was. Oh. So it was, it was a question of here, Frank, if we do this, um, you know, I'll put a good word in if you like. Um, number one lodge in London, good mate of mine, um, senior grandmaster, I'll get you an invite. Really? <laughs> so Frank and I squared it up. We knew that it would go through with possibly one or two votes going begging. Well, there were two or three local families who didn't want it to happen, but they didn't want anything to happen. And one guy even took it right the way to not just the local newspaper, but he actually complained uh, to uh, some official body or the other, by which time the paperwork had got lost. <laughs> so it went through on the town council. Um, and Isabel and I said, well, of course, um, Hank Moorport, where's Hank Moorport then? Where's Hank Moorport? You know, it's not in Dorset, it's not in Hampshire. Where's Hank Moorport then? The, 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 the town had been twinned with the Reuters somewhere, somewhere in France or somewhere in Germany. And the town councillors and the twinning committee always got a freebie trip. Oh, right. So they were always going out there. And, when, and when, the, when the people from the other towns came, they got a freebie trip. So it was all very cosy. And I said to the town council, I will give you a first class travel to Ank I will give you a place that you can see all, you can read all about Ank I'll give you a free trip. The, uh, the cunning artificers, because it was cunning artificers, not discarding point, the cunning artificers will pay all expenses. Well, that was it. And of course, when it went through, the vote was taken, people were saying, where's my ticket, where's my ticket? So the following week, I went up to the council chamber with seven books. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't read them at those your leisure, you'll, you'll visit that normal So it went through. And then, of course, it hit the, it hit the beat because of uh, certain friends in very low places. Uh, it, it hit the BBC uh, and, and they came down and of course it, it became very, very official then because we've been on the BBC as, <laughs> as, as the Wincanton twin with Ain't Moorport. So it started to dovetail um, and I, I don't think, I don't think, our town has never featured in a book, ever, but certain aspects of certain people that Terry has met when he comes and drinks at Uncle Tom's, or when he goes down to the Bear, or if he goes across down to the Nod, certain aspects have filtered through, because they would do. It's a place he feels very comfortable in. And it's, the, it, it's a place where, a couple of, couple of years ago, uh, at a spring event, there was a, a wedding in the town. And the church is at the bottom of the town, and the pub that does most of the, the, the wedding receptions is at the top of the town, opposite our shop. So, on our side of the street, right hand side, walking down, were people in armour, people as wizards, there was witches, there was people in strange and interesting shirts that nobody else would wear, and, and all the plethora of this world dressing up. Going to the shop, down to the bear, because it was about lunchtime, nobody was going to get a few babies in. Coming from the church, up the street on the other side, were people in their finery with white carnations and suits and long dresses and hats, looking at all this bizarre collection of humanity, much of whom was in very revealing corsets. Including <laughs> Butcher. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and there's an old boy, yes. <laughs> there's an old boy called Jim. A good mate of ours, old Jim. And he's standing at the uh, entrance to his shop as the wedding parties go by. And one of the wedding guests said to him, I say, well, what's going on? And Jim said, nothing. It's <laughs> 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 not there, it's on a Saturday. <laughs> And, and it is. They were filming um, Hogfather. Yeah. They're filming Hogfather, and they wanted to do a bit where uh, death could murder a good curry. And they and God bless him, Terry said, "Well, if you're going to do that, it's got to be in Vaz's, in Vaz's curry house opposite our shop. You see, because which is a, a watering hole. We go there because when Terry is about and Vaz is a curry." Vaz, who is a superb cook, a superb cook, he puts currants in Terry's curry. <laughs> Just so he's got a proper, horrible, old-fashioned English curry with currants in it. <laughs> so, but Terry said, you've got to go to Vaz's. You've got to go to Vaz's. So they send down the actor, who's seven foot tall, and he's got this fantastic, in a wonderful uh, costume, and he's got the skull and the eyes are blue yes. LEDs. And he's got articulated, a, a, hands. articulated hands, a real skeletal hands, yeah. all articulated. And so he puts all this kit on and he gets photographed in the shop and he goes outside the shop and gets photographed. And then he's walking across and up and down the photographer doing this, goes into the curry house, photographer doing this. And there's people going around their daily business. <laughs> 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 About 15, 20 minutes later, a Harley Davidson came up the high street with a fairly large guy on it, and it was one of the Harley Davidson tricycles. Heads turned, <laughs> traffic stopped. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you look at that here Harley going up there. <laughs> Seven foot dead, no, it goes over there. <laughs> You carry on, dear. Uh, 2008, um, there, were, there was some development, new development building going on locally. Uh, Taylor, Taylor Woodrow, I think, and they approached us. Um, and they just started building this new estate on the outskirts of Wincanton. And they said, uh, do you think Terry would allow us to use some of his street names for our development? And so we said, we think probably he'd be delighted. So he went back into chapter a bit, didn't he? Yeah. So we had to submit a list of ten different streets um, that they would then choose, which, which they thought they might use. And they proceeded. And we're now in Wincanton. We have a treacle mine road, a peach pie street, and a chicken field. And chicken field. I don't think we've got lobbing clout. No, we've got Moon Pond Lake. Right. Moon Pond Lake. Moon Lake. Yeah. We've got Moon Pond Lake, yeah. yes. I, and, and nobody bothers to steal the signs yet. <laughs> <laughs> Not photographs taken of them, though. Yes. Yeah, lots are. of photographs. Yes. Yeah. And people now, uh, you know, some visitors come to town, and uh, there will still be people who come in the shop, who look around and go, "What on earth is all this about? Yeah. What on earth are you doing?" And you say, "Well, it's a guy called Terry Pratchett." Now, the really sad thing is. And, it, and I know it affects Terry because we have spoken about it, we've talked about it. Uh, he said, there's more people know him because he's got Alzheimer's yes. Yes. than know him as a successful and innovative <coughs> author. Yeah. And that really pisses him off, yeah. as it would do. And, um, you know, you say, people say, come and say, oh, you say Terry Bradshaw. Oh, is he the one with Alzheimer's? No, actually, well, yes, he has got that, but of course, he's, he's also published over uh, 40 million, 45 million, or whatever it has got. 85 million. Um, 85. 85 yeah, million. Uh, uh, could probably put his hand on 20 million quid cash if he needed to, uh, and, and has um, got millions and millions of fans all over the world, many of whom gather together at regular occasions to, uh, to get drunk in his name. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck about again. <laughs> Your turn. I think we could ask a question as close to 
We do questions. All right, questions. 